history of ever, awarded by readers of concealednation.org. Bigfoot Gun Belts, Thomas's newest brand, launched in 2015. The Hayden-based company specializes in crafting ultra-supportive gun belts, and like every brand under the Tedder Industries LLC umbrella, Bigfoot Gun Belts focuses on delivering high-quality products at an, affordable, at an affordable price. When Tedder's team grew from 30 to 130 employees within two years, and that's hard, you've got growing pains all over the place, he understood the need to find a more accommodating home for his rapidly growing workforce. Shortly after creating Tedder Properties, LLC, the company purchased a 180,000 square foot property formerly known as the Post Falls Outlet Malls in late December 2015. Thomas plans to move the entire company, now over 200 employees, under one roof while le leasing the additional space to local businesses. Sections of the property are currently being renovated. Thomas lives happily with his wife and four children, ages 12, 10, and twins two years old at Post Falls. He enjoys spending time in the Idaho outdoors with his family and friends. Before making every major business decision, the passionate businessman always asks, what's best for the customer? I love that. Please help me welcome Thomas Kelly. So my name is Thomas Tedder, and it was a nice introduction. Thank you. Um, I always like to start off by sharing my mission statement. I think it kind of sums up my philosophy pretty well about business and how I approach it. It sounds a little harsh at first, but I think it's the right approach. It, we used to have one of those like generic mission statements that it seems like so many places I've worked for that you read it once and it's this long drawn out thing and nobody ever remembers it or knows what it is. So we've got one I think that most people that work with us, that they know what it is. Um, so our company creates world-class products and markets them so well that any company foolish enough to compete against us will be bankrupt. And, and then we put, yeah, we put global domination after that. So uh, it really, I want to globally dominate any market that I enter. And uh, unfortunately, concealed carry is, for the civilian markets, a United States thing. But eventually, when we get into police and military holsters, we'll try to globally dominate that. And I, I don't feel bad for the companies that will bankrupt because those jobs will just come here instead of Missouri or wherever they're at. That, that really is my philosophy. It's, uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to take customers from all of my competitors. So this began because I couldn't find a new holster, or I bought a new gun that was new to the market and nobody made a holster for that gun. So I bought one of these uh, cheap little nylon holsters and uh, I had my kids at Chuck E. Cheese and we left and I was running across the parking lot chasing a kid and uh, my gun fell out and went sliding across the parking lot. And at, actually in Arkansas there, there's no open carry like there is here so that's called brandishing. It's actually pretty good misdemeanor down there so um, my wife bought a holster for me that was very similar to the gun that I had and I modified it out of uh, modified the plastic and made it work for what I had and when I was done I thought it looked pretty good so I uh, I got some scrap materials about a hundred dollars worth and that's me making the first holster there when I still had a little hair <laughs> I stood on a book and some foam and just kind of pulled down on the counter and pressed it real hard and uh, got a pretty decent mold out of the plastic and uh, that's that's how I started and just I kept I kept uh, working on the techniques of making the holsters better but just from that version that I was able to make like this my friends and family were asking for them I know a few cops who were asking for them for uh, off-duty kind of thing so I slowly started to sell the product um, it was mostly just word of mouth I had a few listed on Craigslist people would come to my house and I'd make a holster for them and I put a few on eBay and it got to the point where I was making holsters. I, I would get home from work, and I was working on second degree, and I would just be making holsters all day into the night. And so um, I decided I had to do one or the other. I couldn't live both ways anymore. So I quit, and my wife joined me, and we still worked a lot of crazy hours, but it was just the holster stuff. Um, I think we both worked 16 hours a day, seven days a week for probably a year and a half starting the business. It was a lot of work. but. Uh, it's done really well. One of the 
one of the things I did early on, um, the, one of the first things that really helped me to start to grow is when I hired employees, I stopped making holsters. I started, my job, my focus was growing the business. And I read a lot of books. I, I, I didn't come from the business world. I didn't, I didn't know anything about marketing or branding or anything like that. I didn't even know what marketing and branding were really. So I bought a bunch of books and I would read them and I searched Amazon for the best reviews. Some of them aren't that great, but most of them were pretty good and there were a few that I thought were just absolutely fantastic. And what I did was I kept a little spiral notebook for each book that I read. And as I read it, I would make notes about how I could apply that to my business. And most of it worked. These guys, they do things for like 30 years, an entire career. And then I would learn in two weeks the highlights of their 30-year career. Um, so I really believe that, like these are my four favorite books. I think somebody who studies these and knows them well is better off than somebody with a marketing degree. Um, if you look at a marketing degree, there's probably five actual marketing classes in a four-year degree. There's not a lot there. Um, the Guerrilla Marketing, I think, is was probably the most important book for me to read initially. It teaches that advertising is not, and marketing in general, it's not a, it's not an expense. It's an investment. And you have to do it, and you can't expect immediate returns. Um, I've learned that you can measure results pretty close to immediately, but you can't expect immediate returns. Uh, Jay Levinson talks about a six month to 12 month cycle before you see the full effect of an ad and I've actually seen it to be more like two to three years. You see a pretty good effect in six to 12 months but for the full effect of the marketing cycle for, from what I've done it's two to three years and now we've got a pretty well uh, saturated uh, name recognition not completely but pretty good. Um, positioning is after you learn that you have to advertise positioning is that's to me, that was hugely important because you can't just be everything to everybody. I had to decide what position in the market I was going to take. And there's a lot of strategy there. The narrower you go, the more vertical you can attack a, a position, the faster you'll take over that, but you'll also max out a little faster. So it's important not to go too wide or too narrow on your position, but um, I feel it's very important to establish a position and then branding now that I know what position I wanted, which was concealed carry, now I'm going to brand that. And so I'm really protective of the brands and I work really hard to grow the brands um, and not jeopardize those in any way. And then now that I know how I'm going to brand a product, then it just gets into advertising. And there's a lot of advertising books. Most people think marketing is just advertising and I don't believe that. I think marketing is... Um, any, any way that your customer sees or intera interacts with you is marketing, your customer service, your signs. If you drive a company vehicle, it's the truck you drive up to their house in. All of that's marketing. Um, so advertising is the biggest part of marketing, though, because it's how you get your name out there and known. And this is a pretty good one. Cash advertising talks about a lot of uh, techniques that this guy learned in an agency over 30 years. And um, it's not like a Bible or anything about advertising, but it's just a good starting place to learn a lot of things. So I started growing the brand, um, Old Faithful Holsters first, and then uh, after a while, I, a year and a half, I believe, I, I learned a lot. And then I was able to take that and roll it into Alien Gear Holsters. I launched that with what I'd learned from Old Faithful. And another a, a reason also for creating the new brand was uh, uh, the lower price. I was able to, with new manufacturing techniques, I was able to get my price down a lot, which really helps accelerate the brand. And uh, with the... Sorry, I lost my train. Oh, yeah. With the uh, with the Alien Gear holsters, what really separated that from Old Faithful was the name and the logo. So that's a huge part of, of branding, too, is the name and logo, I learned, can just instantly put you so much further ahead right off the bat. So that's a pretty important area to focus on. That's another reason for starting the Alien Gear holsters. So this is, that's the, the name and the logo there. And a uh, quick tip for you, that logo cost me about $100. There are a ton of these agencies out there who charge thousands of dollars for logos, and I've wasted money there. Um, 48 hours logo is the best thing. I, we still 
new brands, we're, new things we're working on. We still just throw it out to 48 Hours logo. And we've got a talented team in-house of uh, graphics designers. But you'll get 100 submissions on here in two days. People from all over the world. And uh, we, we'll throw like $500 most at a, at a uh, contest. And so uh, the name and the logo face is to, I try to put a face in everything now like Bigfoot, and we found that through, uh, well, through marketing research and also through user testing that faces helps a, helps a person remember a logo better. And so a person will have to, I'm kind of getting out of order a little bit, so, but a, um, a person will have to see a logo or an, an advertisement 20 times, they say, to, before they have to buy it. And what I found is if your logo is super memorable, you can really start to shrink that down to where it's not, maybe it's 15 times or 12 times. The better your advertising, your logo and all that is, the, the better it shortcuts all that. So this is our current line of products. It's come quite a ways from where we started. Um, I'm trying to do as much injection molding as possible. All these clips, this is injection molded, the face here is injection molded, and that's all in-house. It lowers the labor, it's higher quality, it's a lot cheaper for the materials, and then you can also charge more for them. Um, that backer there, everybody else is using leather still, but that backer cost me about a third of the cost of leather, and I can charge more for it. So um, this is this is a pretty nice generation. But in January, we hope to launch the new generation that's going to make this look old and out of date. So marketing is the most crucial ingredient to my success. I believe that 100%. Um, I've spent a lot of time and resources developing our marketing department. We've really built a world-class marketing infrastructure. Um, I've had people come to my marketing meetings and say, like, holy crap, you guys have an entire like advertising agency here. Um, we've developed an SEO department in-house, I think about five people, and that's going to be expanding to 10. Um, SEO is search engine optimization that basically when someone searches Holster, they find us on Google is what that means. We've got a social media department, a graphics department, a video department, um, any, anything we need. We have a user experience person. We have copywriters, two copywriters that just write the copy that goes into advertisements and videos. So every little tweak, every little thing that you can put, every bit of polish really helps to separate us from other people. Um, it's kind of one of the, uh, you, you can see this in like a high-end uh, store or an apartment building. If the customer thinks when they walk in, it looks like a nice place. They just, if they think they should be paying more for the product they're getting, they're like going into a nice hotel. They, they were willing to pay more without even batting an eye at it. And if you can give them that experience and, and not even charge them more, it really helps a lot. So people don't want to buy, this is, this is the, we hang this in marketing. This is a big, a big thing for us. Nobody wants to buy a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. So it's very important to sell the solution, not the tool. And I've backed this up time and time with empirical data in advertising. So on our Bigfoot gun belts when we launched that, we had a problem with conversion rates. Um, in what I call problem, it's actually a good conversion rate, but not for what we're capable of. So out of so many people that come to our website, we want so many people to purchase. And the industry average is about 2.5%. If you can get up around 4%, you're doing really well. Well, we convert somewhere between 8 and 10% on Alien Gear holsters. So one out of eight customers, between 8 and 10, will buy, uh, or one in 10, one of the 12, will buy a holster from us. And with Bigfoot, we were having a problem. We were only converting at about 5%, 4.5%, something like that. And we started looking at it, and we were selling a belt. We weren't selling what the gun belt does. And so we put a picture up in the top that shows, when you first go there now, that instead of selling just a pretty picture of a gun belt, we show a gun belt that's sagging with a gun on it and a little slider. And you can see what ours looks like and the opposite and what it looks like. And our conversion rate jumped by like two points instantly, just like that. So, and we're still working on it and through some experiments, we've also learned that our price needs to come down a little bit on that to get the conversion rate up. So, but it's sell the solution, not the tool. It, it makes a huge difference right off the bat. If you can double your conversion rate, that's like getting twice as many customers in the door. So the brands, like I was saying earlier, that, those are the real assets and I protect those. We've got millions in inventory equipment, you know, real estate, all that, nothing, it's, it's, it's all pennies compared to the value of the brands. The brands are where the real money is, and so we're never gonna we're never gonna take a short term uh, gain to, for, and damage the brand long term. So Alien Gear holsters, I've never run a sale on, and that's on purpose. We're trying to protect that brand. 
um, user testing and polling is something that's it's a huge shortcut. So data is everything. It's 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 how we do what we do, and as fast as we do the growth, uh, we grow very fast. It's just analyzing data, measure, measure, measure. But user testing is like a, it's a it's a great shortcut. So we put advertisements everywhere, all over the place, and we're always measuring to see what the effect is. We know we ask every customer where they heard of us, so we know where where it's coming back. And uh, I can get into that and how to to eliminate the the bad data from the good on that. If anybody wants, they can ask me later. Um, so with user testing, though, you can get a nice big chunk of that right off the bat without having to wait for the advertisements to come back to measure. It shortcuts you. You're like, it gets you like 75% of the way there really quick. And I use usertesting.com. They used to just test websites, and we use them for advertising testing, and I think they're starting to roll some of that in. They see us doing that so much. Um, so we, when I first was advertising in magazines, even after reading all these books, I was losing money, a lot of it, and I couldn't figure it out. And I learned most people lose money on advertisements. So I took a stack of magazines like this high. I cut out every holster ad. I cut out the best gun ads that I saw. I loaded them up to Flickr. I went to usertesting.com, and I asked them to look at my ads. And I would show them like big, a lot of ads at a time, maybe one or two. But some of the things I would ask is, OK, here's 20 ads. Point to the one that you like the best and instant, like which one grabs your attention and then we could start seeing patterns of what was drawing their attention and then we could say what words do you like, what words don't you like, what images do you like, those sorts of things and then I came up with five things that was really consistent across the board and to this day several years later it's always the same five things. Um, it's uh, the logo, high res image of the holster or the product, a human using the product, the price and for our customers it's the American flag, it may not be in every industry um, but they really want to see those things. And so we've learned that through user testing and even with all of those things in every ad, we still use it, we'll make a bunch of those user test them because some of these ads like in the NRA magazine, it's, it's a huge cost, it's like $12,000. Sorry, question? The, the user testing site that you go to is a uh, collection of people who will come just to that site to give opinions? People work there. It's like an online job for them. Okay. So you can say, send gun owners to me. And then you can even throw a qualifier question in up front to see if they really know what they're talking about. And then you can play back as a screenshot video with their voice recorded. And you can play it back at double speed or something like that if you want to speed up the playback. And then uh, you ask their opinions, and they give them. And if you get one in there that's that's not the right person, you can get a you they'll they'll give you your money back on that one and throw you another person. Um, but yeah, it's like a job. Them they just stay there user testing all day. It, it's it's really good though. I was skeptical at first. You get honest, actual good feedback. It, it really is worth it. I'm sorry. What was the fifth thing? For us, it's the American flag. Okay. For, for it depends on the business. Gun owners they want their stuff made in America, so. And I can go over any of this if you guys have questions afterwards, too. Because some of this, I'll hit high level. And if you want to know more detail, I can bore you with it, I promise. Lots of it. So here's an example of some of the ads. So this is a young designer. He just came to us um, when he made this stuff. And he, did a, he, uh, he made the mistake a lot of these guys make. So it looks real pretty. And it's a good ad. It looks like, you know, something expensive. But, and he's gotten most of the elements in here. He's missed the flag. He's got the price, the logo. High, you want the human using it. High-res picture of the gun. But something you got to beat out of every young designer is negative font and all caps. And you'll tell them, and they'll sneak it back in like three months later like you didn't notice. So when somebody's on Facebook reading about their cousin's wedding, they don't care about whatever it is you're selling if you're running an ad on there. If somebody's in a magazine reading an article about what they're reading, they don't care about what you're selling. You have to do every single thing. And yeah, this ad would get some customers, but you want to do every single thing in your power to do everything right so you have a better chance of pulling them away. Click-through rate on a banner ad is like 0.2%. That's like one in one in 500 people or something. So if you can make that 0.3%, you've got a 50% increase. So this negative font is hard to read. Every designer always wants to do that, and they want to put everything in all caps. You should capitalize the first letter of each word. Uh, it is, but even if you see a beautiful ad like this, don't let them... Don't let them shortchange on those last little details. And all of this stuff is in those books I've mentioned. And we've verified all of it through user testing. The 
part about the human's not. I heard about that from a guy who sells bandanas on the internet. He sells over a million dollars worth of bandanas a year. We're talking those like dollar bandanas you can buy at Walmart. His big secret was everyone was on a human. And that was his big secret. It really does work though. And we verified that user testing. They like it. Um, metadata is a set of data that describes information about other data. Metadata is huge for us. Um, basically, it's when everybody checks out, we've got all their, so we know what time of day they bought, where they're at, how much they spent, where they heard of us, how much they spent if they heard of us through this area. So that's just, we collect the data. And so we can go back later and run queries on that data and find out more information about the data. It helps us uh, dial in our advertising. So this is one of those things I'm going to try and gloss over, but I can go on and on about this for hours. If you have questions, I can get into details. So this is an example of our back end. When we want to get data from the website from the, for the marketing department, we don't go to the IT department and say, run this query for me, like most companies do. What our marketers do is they go to the IT department and say, build me a widget that does this. And so it's just a graphical user interface. So all the mark so the, the IT department, it's a little more work the first time to build this. But now the marketing department can just click the little options and run their own queries forever. So every day, every week, they can run their own queries and see how this advertisement's doing or how sales are going in this state. So that's something I highly recommend. If you use a good content management system, uh, we use Magento, then you can go back in and your programmers can add these sorts of things on the back end and uh, um, make it really easy for the marketing department to pull the data out. And initially, I was, I was a programmer in my previous career, so I made these myself for my own ease so I could go back later and easily pick out data. And then as we grew, I just had the new programmers that came on do this. And you can hire programmers cheaper than you think, too, by the way. Um, Out-of-house programming is, is not the way to go. Um, my first programmer I hired for $15 an hour, and he was the best student. I went to the head of the department at my college and said, who's the best programmer you've got? He was still in college. I offered him 15 bucks an hour, and he was happy to have the work while he was in college. And he was better than I am, better than I ever was, and I had experience. Just a super genius kid, and he still works for me today full time. Um, but you can get a good, talented programmer pretty cheap if you go to a college and, and ask him for somebody who's pretty good. You said Magento? Magento, there's a lot of content management systems. That's the one we use because it's the most powerful. So M-A-G-E-N-T-O, it's like the color, and it's free. You don't have to pay anything for it. So where's the data coming from on this? There's a database. Every time somebody buys something, it goes into the database on our, on our server. And so... Um, so you're collecting it? Yes. I have a dashboard. It's like this, but way bigger with all the stuff. And so anything in the database, we can pull it out and display it in the back end. And any content management system is going to have, they're going to have a default dashboard, and it's just going to show you your orders for that day, all kinds of default data. Um, and, and then you just, you can arrange it and look deeper for what you want. And so we look for a lot of stuff. We know what time of day people are buying. We know what day they sell the most. We know if we send an email on a Thursday at 4 o'clock, we're going to get the most replies. And that's all from looking at data on the back end. So here's an example of some of the data. Now, this is the chart we have to build on our own. But this is the kind of thing you can do. And uh, I don't know if this is a phenomenon of anybody else, but with my company, um, what I've noticed the green line is website conversion rates and the black line is traffic and we overlay these two lines. And what we find is as traffic goes up, conversions go down. And it's a very helpful tool for us just looking at data. This, are, this is an inverse relationship, so they should be going like this. But we see areas where two are going down or two are going up. And for us, usually if two are going up, if something like a terrorist attack or Christmas shopping, people are primed to buy. What we're really looking for is the two lines going down. So why are con website traffic's going down and conversions are going down and there's something wrong? And it, it, oftentimes it's like our site's running slow or something like that, and we can just jump on it and instantly fix that. So we go through it. You don't have to get this complicated. It took me years to get to this point, but uh, it's, it's just limitless. You can just keep building on it and building on it and dialing in. And it's just di once you think you're maxed out, you just keep dialing in numbers and you just keep bringing in more revenue and higher orders. How often do you check that metric? Um, the entire management marketing team reviews that monthly. The marketing department probably looks at that, I would say, once a week. We, if there is a website issue, we do we know instantly with that with the IT department. But that actual chart there, probably weekly. 
but sales and things like that we look at every day. We have a full marketing meeting and SEO meeting every month um, where we go over every bit of data. It's, it's, it can get to be like two, three, four hours long sometimes, but we always pull out a lot of great data and we're always like adjusting based on what we're seeing. This is ways that we track our competitors. Uh, you cannot track just yourself. You can track your competitors. There are tools out there, and they're cheap, like 40 bucks a month. It'll show website traffic to your competitors and how you're doing against them, how you're showing up in Google against them. And so we like to be the top line, and when we're not, we go fix it. Um, but there's, you can scrape Amazon. You can put, <coughs> go to your competitor's product, throw 999 of them in the cart, and it'll say, oops, they only have 426 on stock. And then you go back a week later and do the same thing, and they say, oops, they only have 399 in stock. Well, now I know they sold 27 in that time period. <laughs> so you can, you can find out what your competitors are doing, and we do that. We definitely do that. Why do they all go down on that one? Google changed their algorithm. What? That's a Google algorithm update. That April? Huh? That April? Uh, that's August. It's, okay. They used to update like huge updates now and then. Now it's almost like they can change it and then a week later change it again. So we got a really good SEO guy there on top of that. They're, we've got several websites we maintain that don't really sell anything. Their entire job is just to rank some meaningless made up product on Google and then uh, when when Google updates their algorithm, we can go try one thing, change one thing on all these different websites, and when it jumps up in Google, we know what they change, and then we can go implement that on our website. We, we, <laughs> no stone unturned. No stone unturned. So social media is big. It's I would say 20% of our 15 to 20% of our revenue comes through Facebook advertisements. And you don't ignore the other ones, though, because we get 10% through YouTube, advertisements, uh, videos on YouTube. So we have a, a video department, and they just churn out videos on YouTube. And for two years, I lost money. But now, we make 10% of our revenue through there. Those guys paid for themselves so many times over because every time they put another video, it stays there on YouTube and just keeps getting viewed day after day after day. And it's just things like top 10 concealed carry guns, people looking for a new concealed carry gun. And at the end, there's a little three second blurb about alien gear. And it just drives in free advertising is all it is. And Google owns YouTube. So it, it, you can rank in YouTube very similar to the way you do in Google. And ranking in one helps you rank in the other. Uh, Instagram, you would think that that's a, a kind of a worthless place to advertise, but by throwing your tons of pictures in Instagram with the right labels on them, then you can rank huge over in Google. It's a huge uh, leg up in ranking on Google. So Google Plus is the same thing, even Twitter. So just if you just spend five, ten minutes a day just on each website, even Vine, we have like six second videos, it's, it just hit all of them, just pay them all a little bit of attention and it all adds up to be a lot. <coughs> So this is more of the same philosophy, business is war, I do everything in my power to beat my competitors on every single front. I've heard things like uh, uh, price, speed, and quality pick two. I don't believe that. I think I can have all three, and we do. Um, the price, quality, design, customer service, warranty, marketing, manufacturing, efficiency. I don't rest on my laurels and give up and say, well, I can't be the cheapest because I'm doing a high quality, or I can't, have it, I can't deliver this super fast because of uh, I'm spending uh, all this time on manufacturing. So we really try to hit every single thing, and, and we just continually dial in and never rest. Always every department, the managers, they're always, they have their directives, and we're always updating where you're at now. Okay, now we're going to move the goalpost. Just always moving the goalpost and never resting. And it's very, it's very, very easy to compete against me and holsters. I started with $100. The barrier to entry is very low. And I'm trying to change out with new designs with a higher barrier to entry. But when I go to SHOT Show in Las Vegas, a big convention, I've got like 250 booths there with other holster makers that compete against me. So it's, it's very competitive. That's the reason I have to, I think I have to look at it like it's a war and I have to go at it at every single front. And we are winning, by the way. We're the number one concealed carry in the country to civilians, not to police and military. 
So uh, product development, we spent a lot of time and money on this. There's a lot of copycats out there. The big guys copy is too, Galco. When we came out with our version two holster, it had a steel core and neoprene, or it had a plastic core and neoprene. In almost one year to the day, Galco released their plastic cord uh, composite holster. Well, the very next week, we released our steel core patent. So that product development just keeps us ahead. We released a stainless steel spring steel holster that we got a patent on. Now they can't copy us, but we're still developing new products that just make the old stuff outdated and obsolete. So product development is, is for me, the easiest way to stay ahead of competitors. Um, it also gets you the awards. The magazine people, they like to talk about the new stuff. They don't want to rehash the old stuff. So we've got our last design, got NRA's Editor's Choice the Award, uh, Gear of the Year Award, um, Best Holster in History of Ever, two years in a row. And if you can win any of these awards, plaster that thing all over every advertisement you make. Um, really brag about it because that's, uh, that's one of the... I can't, it's been a while since I had philosophy in college. There's like seven arguments that they make, and one of them is the endorsement, celebrity endorsement, basically. And so if you can say the NRA magazine says we're editor's choice, then they, well, I can give up my search. Obviously, that's the best one, right? So if you win any of these awards, plaster it everywhere. And you can go out and try to get those, even if it's a small one no one's ever heard of. You know, if you don't have any awards, make up a little seal and say, best, <laughs> best holster. Yeah, best holster according to who? Me? But, I mean, uh, you. if you look at this, I noticed it in uh, Walmart one time. I think I was looking at diapers. And they all had this little seal on there. It's little gold seals. Like three or four of them had this little seal. Um, other companies use it because it works. Big companies like Procter & Gamble on them. There's our current generation of holster as our uh, composite. So this is injection molded here in the front. That's our stainless uh, steel. It's a spring steel, ballistic nylon, and uh, neoprene. And that's everybody else is just throwing a slab of leather on the back, and it's it's uh, separating ourselves from every, everybody else. It's being something different, and and being better, different too, and that really helps drive growth. Manufacturing efficiency. I spent a lot of time on this. Um, the less it costs to make a product, the less I can sell it for. The less I can sell it for in general, the more I'll sell. There is a limit to that at a certain point. Um, so we're about to release mag carriers, and we found that through our testing that we'll sell as many at $25 as we will at 30 the exact same. But at 35 it's like this huge jump up. And so we really try to get it as low as we can. And usually, like that price point where we know would be the optimum number of sales, everybody else is usually quite a bit ahead of that, quite a bit above that. So I really try to get the price down as much as possible. And also, like, and I know I need to be at $30 in this next product. By getting the manufacturing efficiency down, I make it for less and I get a higher profit margin. And my net profits are higher than most people's gross profit margins, um, but multiple probably. Um, and it's because of the manufacturing efficiency. It's a huge, huge part of it. And the injection molding is a great way to do that, by the way. Um, if you ask people the rice, uh, rank price, you can ask them what's the most important for your holster. Concealability, durability, comfort, price, all these things. They're always going to put price dead last, and it's honestly probably like the first or the second most important thing to them. Uh, all the other stuff, you take it to the bank and base your advertising on it. Uh, your slogans, everything, because everything else will be what they say it is in that order. But the price, I think it's a social stigma about saying, oh, I'm not a tight wad or something. Um, that's the only thing they're, they're not honest about. So that's really hard to figure out in polling. With pricing, we do implement some polling as part of our research, but it's usually off by quite a bit. Um, injection molding is huge. Once we got there, prices really started to drop for making products. And getting that in-house, too, by the way, um, our injection molding supplier told us we couldn't do it in-house. We'd be crying them, crying back there, crying, asking for help. Um, they named other big companies that have tried it and just came right back. Um, we bought these big, fancy machines. We've got a million dollars worth of injection molding equipment. We had it, it's German. These German guys, they flew in, they set it all up. That day we were making perfect parts. Those machines paid off in three months. Um, don't let people tell you you can't do injection molding in house because you can. Our parts went down from like, some of the parts were like 75 cents and now they cost me less than a quarter. So it's, it's a huge savings right off the bat. And it's, it's really not that difficult 
um, we hired one guy who was really good at injection molding and he's in there running the machines and running the crew, trained everybody else in house. 10 minutes sales? Okay, I think I am getting close here. Um, automation, we've got an automation department now, so that's one of those, the jury's still out on that one. I spent half a million dollars and we're not really automated anything. I mean, the parts we have automated have gone back out of the production again, so we're hoping that eventually we can have computerized assembly lines moving parts to the human who just assembles it without having to pick parts because that's our biggest uh, that's our biggest defect when customers call back is they got the wrong stuff so we're hoping to have robots pick the parts and deliver it on a conveyor um, the machine shop something too that's tough that's been real hard to do so uh, with injection molded molds we're sending a lot of that out. We're making one a week now in-house, and it's not enough, so we're sending a lot out of house. And to be honest with you, we can make them as cheap out of house in China as we can here. When we were making them over in Spokane, they were like 10 times more than our cost, which is why we started the machine shop. Now we've got suppliers in China that can make them as cheap, and they're as good as us. So it's, we're still gonna prefer to do it in-house because there are guys, and it's right here, right next to, to the room where they're actually running. But uh, I would skip the machine shop if I was just starting into this until you get the capital and the expertise. Uh, customer satisfaction, we really focus hard on this. Um, my competitors, they are all just itching to give my customers more attention than I am. So we really focus hard on this. Everybody is... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just a free market. Everybody's working so hard. Everything they can is still a customer. So we have to have the best warranties. If somebody calls in, um, we do what's best for the customer regardless. We hang it on the banners, uh, what's best for the customer. We put that in customer service. This lady is, you know, first she's an American with an American accent. That's pretty big. But I used to say, and we run customer service, by the way, 5 in the morning till like 10 at night, 11 at night, something like that, seven days a week, because we're selling holsters seven days a week during those hours. I, mean, I used to say that this lady was empowered to make every customer happy no matter the cost. Now I say she's required to make every customer happy no matter what the cost. Even if somebody ordered a big order and says it never got to them when the tracking order shows it was delivered, we send them a new one. Um, it's just part of business that maybe somebody's going to steal from me here or there, but I'm not going to call a customer a liar and try and figure out who's honest and who's not. One bad customer, you all know, I'm sure, one bad customer, they'll afford a hundred or a thousand good customers that never say anything. So just every single one, we have to make them happy. Um, World-class talent, I don't settle on this. I'll wait several months to find the right person, like our, our SEO department. That's a big part of our business, and I really skipped over a lot of people. I, I think six months maybe trying to find the right person, but now we've got the right person in there, and the guy's just an animal. I mean, he's just like me. He's a tack dog all the time. Um, it really puts a hurt on our competitors, and we beat them all in SEO. There's nobody beating us on Google. I mean, they might rank for this word or that word, one rank higher here or there, but overall, we're crushing them. So wait for the right person. And uh, here's a, something cool I figured out. Training smart people in-house, if you can. How do you know who your smart guy's hiding somewhere? There's a Burke test that we give. It's basically like an intelligence test. And nobody's required to take it. Um, uh, managerial type uh, salary people, we require them in an interview phase to take it. But people who work in production can take that test. And uh, if they score really high on it, we've had a couple people like off the charts, like this dude's a genius. Why is he working on the holster line? And then pull them out and uh, put them in better places that better fit their skills. One of our SEO guys, you can't find SEO people. So it took me six months to find our main guy. So uh, we're training a guy right now and he is gonna be a really talented SEO guy. And uh, we found him in house, just a genius kid, genius. If you find one of those people and they've been with you for a month or two and you pull them out and stick them in a promotional uh, track over some other people who have been there a year or two. You I don't care. Well, I, 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 yeah. No, I agree with that. Right? Yeah, of course. Of course I do. But <laughs> this kid that's uh, really talented, he's SEO. Oh, yeah, a lot of people are mad. I don't care. Okay. He's talented, and I'm not going to – he's going to help everybody around him. 
And just like having the wrong person in a job, he's going to hurt everybody around him. He's going to hurt the entire company by being in the wrong position. So yeah, absolutely I do. But I really don't care. Um, yeah, and then he's making a lot of money too now. Um, a lot more than these other guys who've been here longer. I don't do seniority at all. Um, I think I've got that on another slide right here. I don't do seniority. Um, all of our low-level supervisors are elected. So most people quit a job because of their immediate supervisor. They elect theirs. And we don't get involved at all. They go in a room and they vote. And the, they get a $1.50 an hour raise and they're the mentor. And they're for a month. And they have to be in good standing. They can't be coming in late and in trouble. They have to be trained a certain percentage. Um, and then after two elections, the third one, they get a three-month term. So it's kind of like representative senator. They can make tougher calls, be a little harder on people. It works really well. We've had great employees that that we promoted and were bad managers. And usually you lose those people when you demote them. But we don't this way. They just get demoted and they go back in the line. They were voted down by their peers. They can't say my boss is just mean and stupid. It's everybody you work with sees you're a bad manager, right? And we've had guys who are power happy and came back a couple months later, apologized to the crew and asked them to vote for them again. And they even, and get voted back in. And they even make campaign videos and stuff now. They love it. <laughs> Um, now the mentors, they are that low level supervisor, the first the first level, then the value stream leaders are above them, they can be in charge of 50 to 100 people and these are all mentors so they're promoted from within and the, the mentors vote for the value stream leader, I have veto rights on that and we do make them interview but we've always gone with who, the, who they voted for. They, and they, the mentors, they pick the right people, they really do. Um, so uh, that that sums up that. Tedder Properties, I'll just talk about for a quick second. That's my other company that owns some real estate in the area. Um, we bought the old outlet malls. We're almost done. The south building is where we're moving in. That's the one not on the freeway side. And then uh, the north building we're leasing out. And so I think the north building's about half full, 60% full. If anybody wants some cheap space, I'm screaming deals. <laughs> but, uh, I put a couple million bucks in there, it was pretty run down, and uh, I'm just trying to get cars in the parking lot right now and get tenants in there, and then we'll adjust to market rates later. But uh, we've got some renderings, we hope the south side looks like that, the north side we hope looks like that instead of pink. So uh, coming along, that's the back side. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, sir. I can answer. Plenty of time for questions, and if anybody needs to scoot out for work, I don't mind. I'm not insulting. What's the name of that you Burke, B E R K E. We have just a monthly subscription. All of our, all of our uh, high-level, high-salary people that we hire, we give that to. And there's been, there's there's one case in particular where I hired a person, a high-salary person, and they took the Burke and it said that the logical problem solving and the rap problem solving were just like really low. So this can't be right. This person's resume is just too good. They interviewed too well. I hired the person anyway and now I'm looking for that person's replacement. <laughs> so it's it's pretty good. It's the there's a couple of spots that rapid problem solving and things like that really help. And then for engineers I look at the three D mod there's they have all these three D models and they turn them in different ways and they make them uh, pick out and what's next? You well know, like they rotate it in an odd shape and say they have to be able to compare. And so for engineers they do three D modeling all day. It's pretty important. And so uh, we give them that for sure too. Do you want to sell direct to consumer or do you have resellers too? We have no stores. Uh, online only, we'll do 25 million online this year in revenue. And that's just people to our website. Um, and we used to have a few hundred stores, or maybe a hundred, I killed them all. We've got like 600 people that have called us. Our brand is so strong, they say, can we please sell your holsters? And we put them on a list. Uh, we were, we've just been too growing too fast and too far behind to do that. But I'm hoping that next year we can start adding stores. He's going to take questions afterwards. <clears throat> and I, he said that he wouldn't mind doing a Q&A. And I thought, after talking to him, it's going to be needed. But we do have people that uh, watch the clock and need to be elsewhere. So we have a few announcements. Uh,